Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar this evening. Uh, before we get started, first I'd like to thank Karen Yates of Alternative Communication Services for providing CART this evening. Thanks so much, Karen. And um, welcome Jeff Plant from Massachusetts. Jeff, um, as you know, is the president of the Hearing Rehabilitation Foundation. He has spent years and years providing auditory training to individuals with hearing aids and cochlear implants. And at Convention 2016, just recently in Washington, D.C., he was awarded the HLA 2016 President's Award. And I wanted to uh, note that in the nomination for Jeff's award, our board member, Catherine Bouton, wrote, he's a remarkable man with a remarkable talent for helping people hear better solely through training the brain. So I know that this is going to be an interesting presentation. And Jeff, I'll, I'll thank you very much for presenting again and let you get started. Thanks very much, Nancy. And good evening to everyone who's uh, come along to the webinar. I'm going to talk about a very interesting project. And that project is trying to improve what people get from technology. Over the past 30 years, there have been huge advances in hearing technology. Hearing aids and cochlear implants have really changed the lives of people with hearing loss. But it would be really difficult to argue that there have been great advances in the provision of aftercare over the same 30 or so years. We've got much better technology, but in some ways, the support for people with hearing loss has decreased. It's the best of times in some ways because technology offers assistance to people with a very wide range of hearing loss. Hearing aids, cochlear implants, the very rapidly emerging range of PSAPs, and assistive technology are changing the way we think about hearing loss. And in some ways, it's the worst of times. Support offered to people with hearing loss is much poorer than it has been in the past. And I believe it's because of a rather blinkered and quite naive view that technology has solved all of the problems created by hearing loss. Many professionals would argue that there's no pressing need for support after a hearing aid has been fit or the CI has been mapped. The technology will solve all the problems. And so hearing aid users or CI users often feel that they've failed the technology. They blame themselves because they haven't achieved the results that were promised or maybe expected. Others take a more reasonable view, in my opinion. They want a better, they want a more expanded service. So some people are saying, what's wrong with me? But I really believe that what people should be saying is, why aren't I getting more support? Other people realize that no technology can achieve the same results with all users. And they ask why there's no follow-up support. Where are the hearing physical therapists? Where are the hearing personal trainers? Why are we expected to cope without any form of follow-up? George Santayana is probably remembered most for this one quote. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Audiology dates back to the 1940s, and in that time there were two very important events. The first was the advances in technology that allowed the development of truly wearable hearing aids. The second was, and in some ways just as important, that hearing retraining centers were set up by the US military during World War II. Here's an advertisement for a hearing aid that nowadays most of us would look at askance because it's so large. The first retraining center set up by the military was at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington. But soon the demand was so great that four separate centers were set up in various parts of the country. And at first they focused on lip reading training. But very quickly there was a shift towards the use of residual hearing. Service personnel were posted to these facilities for several months. They received lip reading training 
what was then called auricular training, we would now call it auditory training, speech conservation and information counselling. The training was provided one-on-one -on -one and also in groups. And one of the greatest things about this was the opportunity for people to mix with others with hearing loss. Here's a picture of Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady at the time, meeting one of the soldiers who was being rehabilitated at one of the centers. And here are some other pictures. They're taken from the Volta Review, by the way. If you look back in the Volta Review in the 1940s, it's full of information about these centers. And it shows some of the group activities taking place and also an ontologic examination. This is someone who not many people know about, Mary Wood Whitehurst. And I believe she was one of the most influential and creative people working in this area. She worked at Hoff General Hospital during World War II, and she was responsible for starting auricular training in the summer of 1944. And we're very fortunate that she described her program in an article in the Volta Review in May 1946. What she did, I think, in some ways could be imitated. Nowadays, the only difference would be we have better testing facilities, we have better um, technology. She would do pre-training testing, look at people's ability to understand instructions, understand short sentences. She looked at word perception skills, including some minimal pairs. If people got low scores, if they had difficulties in noise, if one ear was considerably poorer than the other, they went into an individual training approach. If they got good scores, they were able to cope relatively well with noise, and their hearing loss was basically symmetrical, they were assigned to a group training. Auricular training, what we call auditory training, was done using a microphone, amplifier, and headphones. Only after training was done, was finished, was the change made to a hearing aid. Early group training was conducted with headphones and then they would progress on to a hearing aid. The minimum instruction period, have a listen to this, 30 hours, but there was provision for, for more training for those who needed it. And this included information sen sessions and listening training. Training involved both analytic and synthetic materials. There was some work on music listening, including pitch discrimination and listening to the lyrics of songs. Many aspects of this program, I think, would have direct relevance to clinicians working with clients with hearing loss today. Jeff, if I might interrupt you for a moment. Um, there's several people that are finding your voice um, muffled a little bit. Is there another microphone that you can use or maybe speak closer to or get closer to the microphone? Okay, I'll move a little closer. I don't have another microphone that I can use. We tried that one yesterday. It wasn't very good. Is that any better? I can hear you just fine, but there's some um, that are having a little bit of trouble. Maybe just speak up a little bit in volume. Okay. Okay. Sure. The retraining centers closed at the end of the Second World War but a similar service was continued at Walter Reed Hospital. One of the most famous of HLAA members and supporters, Mark Ross, attended two training sessions at Walter Reed in 1952 and 1954. And we owe to him his account, which he describes as a Camelot experience that never is likely to be repeated. There's probably nothing like that available today. But I have to tell you, when you put in the tray in the time, make the effort and participate, you can really accomplish quite a lot. From today's perspective, however, not only was it a bit of overkill, but clearly out of the question economically. The lesson we should take from it is that at, at the time, the US government conceptualized hearing loss as a serious condition. And that attitude needs to prevail and underlay any serious effort at AR today. It's a wonderful quote from Mark and one that I think is particularly relevant. The Hearing Rehabilitation Foundation is celebrating its 20th birthday this year. 
and we've been located all that time in various offices in this building in Somerville, Massachusetts. This is our latest and I hope our last office and it's the office in which I train clients on a one-to-one -one basis. There's also a scope for some group activities as well. This is just another view. I'm currently speaking in that office because I felt that it would be nice and quiet. I didn't really account for the cleaners who would be working. Fortunately, they seem to be in another part of the building right now. Here are some of our clients, people we've seen over the last four or five years. And we've got a wide range of ages from teenagers through to people in their 70s and 80s. And I think this reflects the real need in the community for services for this wide range of people. What I do is auditory training. And what I'm trying to do is improve a person's ability to understand speech, usually via listening only, but I do provide some auditory visual training. Over the past 40 or so years, I've developed a whole series of training programs. And I can select from these materials to suit the needs of an individual client. Although most of the people I see nowadays are CI users, I also am providing training to quite a few people with hearing aids. And the important part of it, and one that I'll come back to later, is the use of the KTH tracking procedure. Speech communication training, which is again my name for what I do, aims at developing the ability to listen for extended periods. People with hearing loss often tell me that it's hard to focus on speech for more than a short period of time. So one of the things I want to do is try and develop a person's hearing stamina. It's a strange expression, but it was one that was thought up by one of my clients and I'm really grateful for her for coming up with it because it's, it talks about how we can improve a person's confidence in their ability to stay on task and it is a demonstration of how well the person can focus in a listening situation. The typical auditory training session I provide is for two hours, one on one, once a week. There's no break in the session but I do make sure that there's plenty of time for chatting, asking questions, just talking about the person's experiences or interests. And I also try to allow some time to listen for enjoyment. So this might take the form of storytelling, it might take discussing a slideshow, things like that. Again, I'll explain what this means as we go further. We start, like in any other physical training exercise, with warm-up exercises. And the idea is to encourage attentive listening. And really what these exercises are saying is, okay, now focus on listening. And the sorts of things we do could be number strings, rhyming alternatives, sentence matrices. And these materials are typically presented without visual cues. The way that I do that is I place that hoop in front of my face. It's got fabric stretched across it. So it obscures my face, but it doesn't obscure the sound. The number strings here is five items. And so I might say to the person, just repeat back what I said. Three, nine, eight, one, zero. If the person can, can do that task easily, I can make it a little more difficult by asking them to repeat the numbers backwards. So if I say three, nine, eight, they say, 893. Or I might give them the numbers, then ask them a question, and then ask them to repeat the numbers back. So I'm making the task more difficult and requiring them to concentrate and focus on their listening. Here's one example of rhyming alternatives. In this case, there are seven rhyming words. She said he was very bureaucratic. She said he was very autocratic. She said he was very systematic. If a person can do that, I might then go on to say, she said he was very democratic and bureaucratic. She said he was very acrobatic and systematic. So again, just making the task a little more difficult. She knows about the, rep the reputation. She knows about the radiation. 
I also have used for many years playing cards. So set of 52 or 53 if you include the joker, which I do. And I might ask per people just to repeat back the six of diamonds, the five of spades. Or I might give a clue as to what the card was, but the person has to work it out. This is a picture card. It's a male card, but it's not the king. It's a red card, but it's not the heart. And the person should respond, it's the jack of diamonds. Analytic training is important because there are many occasions on which we're forced to rely upon the acoustic signal. And we can't use our language knowledge to work out what was said. We've got to pick up what the speech sounds were. So analytic training provides practice in discriminating between speech sounds such as consonants and vowels, or we might look at speech features such as syllabic, um, syllabic number or stress patterns. Here's another example where the initial consonant sound is different and is followed by the syllable ale. Bale, dale, gale, pale, tail, kale, nail. And the person has to identify which one of the seven was it. This is one I've been using quite a bit with clients recently. It consists of 25 alternatives, all of which end with the diphthong I, by, si, di, gai, pri. And I ask the people to have a look at the chart and then repeat back what they said. If their speech has been affected by the hearing loss over the years, I may ask them to point to the word as well as repeat it. If they can get, say, 20 out of 25 correct, I'll then present two of them or three of them or even a string of four of them at the same time. So I might be asking the person to please say pry, chai, tie, sigh. That's an extremely difficult task. Synthetic training, this consists of materials that attempt to replicate the realities of everyday conversation. And can these connected materials enable the client to use their language knowledge to fill in the gaps. And these gaps are often created by hearing loss. Many of you are probably familiar with this picture. It's a visual gestalt example. And if you look very carefully, you can see a Dalmatian dog near a tree and it's sniffing the ground. So what we're trying to do in synthetic training is something like this. We're using maybe a distorted picture, but using our knowledge to fill in the gaps. Slideshows can be an important part of doing this. I've built up a huge collection of pictures over the past 10 years, and I often use these collections related to a specific theme. And I can present them as PowerPoint files or using an iPad. Here's one, Where on Earth? And there are pictures of scenes in South Africa, pictures in Hong Kong. There are lots of pictures, obviously, but I'm just showing a few examples. Malaysia and my home country, Australia. And what I do is I show the picture and then I talk about it. What can I see here? This is the Sydney Opera House at night. It's one of the most beautiful buildings in the world and is probably the most iconic image in Australia. Storytelling, this might seem rather strange to be using with adults, but I think that stories can be very useful because they provide the client with the opportunity to sit back and listen to several minutes of connected speech. The technique has been used in lots of other settings with adults, in hospices, centers for older people with cognitive impairments. And this is Taffy Thomas, who at one time was the storytelling laureate of the United Kingdom. And Taffy has worked a lot with adults sharing folk tales. And I think the, the joy of these stories helps people to come to realize I can follow speech quite well. Speech tracking is something that I use a lot. It's a technique that was developed in 1977 by Carol de Filippo and Brian Scott, who were at the Central Institute for the Deaf in St. Louis. The technique involves reading a story line by line, and the client has to repeat every word that was said 
before they move on to the next line. And this task continues for five minutes. It used to be done by hand, where you would read from a book segment by segment. Then you would have to count up the number of words and divide it by the time that you presented the materials before. And this was extremely slow and extremely cumbersome. Nowadays, the story is re automatically presented on the computer. It's been filled in line by line. It's presented. And I use mouse clicks, right, left mouse button and right mouse button, to mark any words that cause trouble and to indicate when the person has repeated the entire line correctly. It was developed by Carla Expens and Johan Nospilius in Stockholm, Sweden in 1992. KTH is the Swedish abbreviation for the Royal Institute of Technology. There's a live voice presentation, but the text format has been predetermined. It's been entered into a computer line by line. It's displayed on a monitor for the talker, and the computer records the presentation times and repeats. And repeats are the only strategy that are allowed when a blockage occurs. If the person can't identify the word after it's been presented twice, it's shown on a screen like that. So in this case, I'm working with a young man. And if you look at the top of my screen, you can see the story is there. What um, Dimitri can see is the bottom half of the screen, and that's the word that he didn't get and had to be repeated twice. The story that I use is called Kuman Jai, and it's a story that I wrote um, because I wanted to avoid copyright problems. It's very long. It's over 160,000 words long. It's told in the first person, and an attempt was made to use a fairly constrained vocabulary. I didn't want to use much esoteric language. I wanted it to be like a conversation. I also have some introductory activities so people get some background about what the story is about. And the story is set in Central Australia. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, most of you are probably aware that most of Australia is a large desert. And the country out there is very beautiful, but very, very harsh. And so I'm showing pictures just to give people an idea about where the story is set. Uh, part of the story takes place in an Aboriginal community, and this is one Aboriginal community in the, out in the desert. Um, several of the char main characters in the, um, in the story are Aboriginal um, men and women. And of course, you can't do anything about Australia without including some reference to our native uh, flora and fauna. Is three kangaroos, a few camels. The story then moves over to Sydney on the East Coast, which is a much different environment, obviously, and includes one scene set in the Blue Mountains to the west of Sydney. So people are coming in, and they're looking at um, these materials, which is giving them a good idea about what the story, how the story has been set what the environment looks like. And now I want to spend a little bit of time showing you what happens to people with such training. The first person I'm going to show you is a woman in her late 50s. She had a long-term hearing loss and eventually opted to have a cochlear implant in one ear. She continues to use her hearing aid in the other ear. When she first came in, however, I focused almost exclusively on the CI only, the cochlear implant by itself, and the cochlear implant plus the hearing aid. And almost all of the training was done with my face obscured. So she was forced to rely upon the auditory signal. After about six months, I introduced a third condition, and that was the hearing aid only, because I was interested in seeing how well was the CI uh, performing compared with the hearing aid only. And what I sh was able to see was a steady improvement over a period of around one year. And on this um, figure here, you've got the tracking rate. How many words per minute can the person repeat back correctly? And you can see that when she starts off with the cochlear implant, which is the blue line, 
she starts off around 40 words a minute. And over this period of sessions, she eventually gets up to around 100 to 105 words a minute. When you combine the hearing aid and the cochlear implant, which is the gray line here, you can see that her performance was quite good from the very start. But it gradually gets a tiny bit better over time. Not appreciably so, but I think what that reflects is that this person's hearing aid skills were very, very good. And when we introduce the hearing aid about halfway through the training, you can see that her performance matches pretty closely that of the uh, cochlear implant. The best part about this, of course, is that neither of them really match her overall performance when the two are combined. So in her case, the cochlear implant plus the hearing aid is the best option that you could have. Here's what she thought. I asked her recently to tell me what she thought she had gained from auditory training. I thought I had speech discrimination and understanding pretty much under control after wearing a hearing aid for the majority of my life. But as a new cochlear implant recipient, there were plenty of nonsensical sounds swimming around in my head that I struggled to understand. Auditory training simply helped to make sense of sounds and turn them into comprehensible speech. Jeff not only helped me to maximize my comprehension and processing time, but more so guided me in gaining the confidence in my ability to do so. So I think what that says is that when she started with the cochlear implant, the sound of the cochlear implant was rather unfamiliar. There were many speech sounds which I don't think she'd probably heard for decades. Uh, sounds such as the S and the burst of the T, for example, are probably sounds that hadn't been available to her in most cases for many, many years. So when they came back, at first, they may have even been a bit of a distraction. But by taking part in a comprehensive training program, she was able to assimilate this new information and use it really very, very well. Client two is a woman in her early 50s with a congenital progressive hearing loss. She went from having a mild hearing loss in elementary school to being profoundly deaf by her mid-20s. Sometime after that, she stopped wearing hearing aids because she gained nothing from them. And she relied upon lip reading and American Sign Language as her forms of communication. Most of you who have tried to rely upon lip reading probably know two things about lip reading. One, it's an extremely difficult process. And two, it's an extremely tiring process. Even the best lip readers will tell you after about an hour of concentrated lip reading, they feel like going and lying down somewhere because it's just such hard work. Sometime in her late 40s, early 50s, she decided that the time had come to try a cochlear implant. She felt she had nothing to lose, and that was really her motivation. But once she received the implant and realized that she was getting quite a bit from it, she realized she needed to get some training. And she saw her motivation as being to receive personal training for her brain and for her hearing. I'm sure many of you have heard Carol Flexer say, we hear with our brains. And this client certainly recognized that. This is her performance using speech tracking for the red line is um, the cochlear implant only, and the blue line is the cochlear implant plus lip reading. And what you'll notice, each of these points here is 12 five-minute tracking sessions. So what we have here is 10 hours of tracking in the cochlear implant situation alone and lip reading plus the cochlear implant. Now, if you look at these, you'll see that there's quite a rapid improvement in both modalities in the first three hours. She moves from around in the uh, auditory 
the CI only condition from around 55 words a minute up to about 80 words a minute and then the performance seems to plateau. And if you look at that, you might think, well, why does she keep coming in for training? And the reason is that she felt that she was getting better, except she did suffer from some periods of frustration because the really good periods would be interspersed with some bad ones. And here's a good example of it. This is each session, each five minute session. And what you can see, especially towards the end, is that her performance is going up and down and up and down. And why she wants to keep attending for training is she wants to have these marks, which are the high ones, become the only marks that she has. And so she's prepared to keep training to that end. And I think that when you have that sort of will, that sort of um, belief, you you are going to get better. If you're prepared to put in the time, you are going to get better. Here's her reaction to the question, what do you get from auditory training? I always want to get still higher tracking rates and sentence scores in oral rehab sessions, but I'm finding that it's really more about continuing to develop listening endurance, stamina, and learning to listen mindfully, regardless of stress, energy levels, or distractions. I've noticed the more mindful I am during an individual five minute tracking segment, the higher the number and the ease of listening. Again, I think it's much better to have the client's reactions rather than sometimes just the raw scores. Speech tracking is, as you've probably guessed, an extremely difficult situation. So for some clients, it's far too difficult. So what I have decided, what I tried to do about 30 years ago was develop a technique which in some ways mimicked speech tracking but was not as difficult. And so what I do is I use a modified task where I present a story line by line. I usually allow one repeat of each line and then I ask the person to tell me, what did I say? I then score how many words they got correctly and then I then show them the line. And if they didn't get all the words correct, I repeat it for them so they can hear it and read along with it. I also sometimes use this task in noise with clients who have got higher tracking rates but find it very, very difficult to cope in noise. This is a little less challenging and not as intimidating as speech tracking in noise for some people. Here's an example of one of the stories that I've used. I often adapt stories of Hans Christian Andersen for training. I enjoy his stories and I find that clients find them very amusing. This is what appears on a monitor screen for the client and they're told they're going to hear a line. And the line is, I'm going to tell you a story. I might repeat it once, I'm going to tell you a story the client responds and then I show him or her what the line was. And if they didn't get all the words, I will repeat it. I'm going to tell you a story. And then I repeat the next line and I do this until a total of 200 words have been presented. So each part that's presented, I then calculate the person's percent correct score. This was a woman in her, and I've just realized I've made a mistake here. This was a woman in her early 50s with a congenital hearing loss. She had worn hearing aids for most of her life, but she relied heavily upon lip reading for speech understanding. When she started working with me, she was an, unable to complete any open set auditory exercises. In fact, she later told me that if I had attempted any open set auditory training exercises with me, she was prepared to walk out of the room. She felt so unsure about her ability to understand speech. She had never been able to understand speech by listening alone with hearing aids and she certainly wasn't confident that her implant would provide enough information for her to learn to do it at this stage in her life. This was her performance with one of these modified tracking tasks. She starts off around 40% correct. And even that score came as a big shock to her. 
she hadn't expected that she would be able to do this to get 40% of all the words that were presented um, correct when the materials were presented without the printing keys and it was a story she had never heard before. And so each of the parts, like I said, is 200 words and you can see that there's a gradual, quite lovely improvement in her scores. She goes from around 45% at the start to somewhere over 80% towards the end. And with this client, I was then able to introduce speech tracking. And over a period of well over a year, her speech tracking rate, auditory only, improved to around 45 to 50 words a minute. This was one of the most amazing changes I've ever seen in anyone's ability to understand speech. And it still stands out to me as one of the biggest improvements I've ever seen. Because she went from essentially no ability to understand speech alone to being able to understand speech at a rate that might allow her to make simple phone calls and things like that. Things she had never done in her life before. And she was constantly coming in and telling me about things she had heard people saying at work. Things like that that she had always missed. And she really loved her cochlear implant. A lot of what I do has been influenced over the last few years by the work of Erickson and his colleagues. Erickson is a psychologist who, among other places, trained at Harvard University. And he's been interested for an extended period of time in what is it that enables people to become an expert. And an expert is someone like Bill Gates, it's someone like the Beatles, someone who is at the top of their field. Among other experts that um, um, Malcolm Gladwell talks about in his book Outliers are ice hockey players. Not surprising given that Gladwell is Canadian. And the thing that he notes, the most striking thing that sets these people apart from other people is the 10,000 hour rule. And what he finds is that the people who become experts are people who have worked systematically at their field for an extended period of time, 10,000 hours. Now, I'm not suggesting that any adult CI user or hearing aid user could practice listening for such an extended period. But Erickson's work emphasizes that performance level is correlated with the amount of practice. Arthur Boothroyd, um, an audiologist who was for many years at City University of New York, and a great influence on me and many other people in the field of oral rehabilitation, talks about time on task. The more time you spend on a task, the better you become at that task. There have been some more recent work where people have looked at, is there something about these experts apart from the fact of the 10,000 hours? One of the things seems to be that this training, this experience that they have, is very systematic. Um, they have the willingness to apply themselves to this training for an extended period of time. And this has helped always if they've got someone who can encourage them, someone who can point out to them, what are the things that you're doing that really make an improvement? And so this sort of support that I hope I give in my auditory training seems to be what Erickson is talking about. Self-training, there are a number of computer-based programs. There's LACE, there's Read My Quips. There are many, many online resources and apps for people with hearing loss. At the very end of this presentation, I'm going to put up a slide which gives my contact details. There are a couple of things that you can ask me for at the end of this. If you would like a list of the iPad apps that I find useful in my work, I can send you a little uh, publication on that. It'll just come as a PDF. All I'll need is your um, email address. Anyone who would like a copy of this presentation, please just let me know. And again, I will send you a PDF of it. So these computer training programs might be 
one way of trying to clock up the hours that we need to improve. I know that many people say that LACE is a good program but they find it hard to continue. I've used LACE myself and I really enjoy it. I think it's a very, very good program and it's one that I think more people should apply themselves and use over an extended period of time. Think about also enlisting the help of family members and friends to start Hearing at Home. Hearing at Home is the name of a program I wrote several years ago for family members to use. But even doing things like speech tracking, you can now download the uh, speech tracking program from the Gallaudet University Speech and Hearing Centre's website and you might find that that's a useful thing to do to practice. It's not only the, the family member with a hearing loss who will benefit from such training. In many cases, the family members who are normally hearing or pretty well normally hearing learn how best to communicate. They learn how best to speak to people with hearing loss. And again, all of these ways can help you clock up the sorts of hours you need to truly become an expert. So, as you've probably guessed, I think auditory training should be an important part of the post-fit period for almost every adult who's fit with a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. We really need to try to ensure that adults get as much support and training as possible. It's just not enough to fit CIs and hearing aids. We need to provide ongoing support. We need to provide ongoing training. We need to provide encouragement and we need to provide affirmation. People who have a hearing loss quite often have lost quite a bit of their confidence in their ability to do listening tasks. So affirmation can really mean a lot. And my last slide I think says it all. Perhaps we need to go back to the future because here we've got this wonderful technology that was available in the 1940s. No, we've got wonderful therapy that was provided in the 1940s. In the 21st century, we now have wonderful technology and we need to combine these two things, the technology and the training to provide the best possible service for people with hearing loss. Here are the details. The photograph was taken at the HLAA Awards breakfast. I was extremely honoured to be awarded this, um, this um, President's Award. It really means a great deal to me. My contact details are there. My email address is h-e-a-r-f at aol.com. If you want to check on our website, it's www w.hearf.org and there's our street address as well. If you'd like to contact me about anything, please do so. I should also mention that we have a Facebook page. So if you look for the Hearing Rehabilitation Foundation, the Facebook page provides a lot of ongoing information and current information on what the HRF is doing at this time. I'll finish by thanking Nancy for asking me to present this and to thank the HLAA for providing the opportunity to talk to you all. Thanks very much. Great presentation. Very informative. Um, one of the things that struck me, Jeff, is when you said um, your clients have two-hour sessions once a week and I can just imagine how exhausted they are after two hours of that intensive uh, auditory training. Um, Art uh, has asked two hours a week, but for how many weeks per client? How, what's the average, I guess? Or how, do, how does a person know when they don't need to come for training anymore? Most people do make that decision sooner or later. I do have some clients, however, who continue coming to see me on a regular basis for a period of years. I don't think this is a bad thing. In some cases, people need that ongoing support. People are very tired at the end of the sessions. 
my favourite client comment ever made was made in this building about 20 years ago by one of my clients who informed me that after she'd been to see me, she was exhausted. And I said, how exhausted? And she said, two gin and tonics. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and she said, when I go home, I have two gin and tonics and then I feel okay. So <laughs> I've often wondered if maybe one of the gin companies would be prepared to support us. But people do come in, I suppose, typically for a year, uh, sorry, six months to a year. But like I said, many people continue to come over an extended period of time. One of the things I sh didn't mention and I should have in passing is that I do do quite a lot of training in noise, especially for people with hearing aids and, and high achieving CI users. And one of the things that I've noticed as a function, I believe, of this training is that I'm much better in noise now than I used to be. I find that going to a restaurant is not such a trial as it used to be. I can usually follow conversations a lot better. And I wonder, in fact I, I believe it's because I'm actually getting training when I'm working with the client in noise. Hmm, interesting. Um, Mary Clark says, I want to know how much success you have had using clients with hearing aids only. She was a part of a study to look at that at House Ear Institute and their protocol wasn't very challenging for her. So I wondered how you handle those clients. One of the joys about speech tracking is that it is a very difficult task. In the days before really high quality hearing aids, if someone got 60 words a minute with um, hearing aids, you would think you, were, you had got to some sort of almost unbelievable point. Nowadays I find that there are many people with hearing aids who are getting 80 to 100 words a minute, even higher than that. And I think you could see in one of my clients her hearing aid performance did operate at that level. And the advantage about, um, I've, I've now got one client who I see mainly because uh, she has a condition which requires her performance level to be monitored on a regular basis. She certainly doesn't need me for training. The other day she was scoring with um, two implants on around 130 words a minute. So that gives you some idea as to how what people could aim to try and attain. <clears throat> so if someone's getting 100 words a minute, there is still a goal in sight. Maybe you could do even better than that. Remembering that what speech tracking is, is the person presenting the line, the person perceiving it, working out what was said and then giving it back uh, to, the, uh, to the speaker. So it's quite a complex task and involves production, perception and production again and obviously perception by the, uh, by the talker. So it is a really good process. This client asked me if um, I would be prepared to let her uh, try to shadow me. What that means is she would try and repeat what I was saying as I was saying it. Now what I was doing is I was presenting each line um, and waiting for her to catch up after each line. But she was then able to do the task at about 150 words a minute. So again, you've got this huge range for people to try to aim for. Now it's not attainable for most people obviously, but it is something that they can go for. So the complexity level is really highly variable. And by putting a bit of noise in the background obviously you make it even more variable and more difficult. Uh, Susan asks, uh, she lives in New Hampshire, how does she connect with auditory training services? In other words, how do we clone you and put you in New Hampshire? I can't think of anything more horrifying than the thought of clone Jeff Plants. <laughs> beggar's description. Um, unfortunately, there are, very, very limited num there are a very limited number of people who are doing these services. I have had now a couple of um, uh, students from Boston University 
who come along and act as volunteers. And they're very keen on doing this after they become audiologists or speech pathologists. And my hope is that over time there will be more and more people who are interested in this work and it will spread. I am trying to organize training sessions for professionals to come and learn about the materials and the approaches that I use and I hope that that will expand the number of people. But there truly is a need for more auditory training. It doesn't necessarily have to be what I do. It's what I feel comfortable doing. But I don't necessarily think it's the best for everyone. I think it's the best for me. And I would love to see more people providing these sorts of services. I um, recently wrote an article about a visit I had in 1977. I had a World Health Organization fellowship. And I visited Denmark and Sweden to look at their oral rehabilitation programs. I look back on that period in the same way that Mark looked back at Walter Reed Hospital. It was Camelot in many ways. People with hearing loss were getting incredible services. The aids that they were using were not great, but the services they were getting, the training they were getting, were quite wonderful. And I would love to see a return to that with modern technology. Um, Linda said, I would love to try this for myself. Is there anything available via computer or online? And I think you um, answered that. I also posted in the chat box, uh, HLA members receive a 30% discount on the LACE program. And I posted the link that's under our member uh, benefits. But maybe there's um, some other things that you might suggest as well. I can also post your um, PDF on our replay page if uh, you don't mind, mm -hmm. so that people do no, have the presentation. No, not at all. Please, please do it. Um, I think LACE is a really good program. People sometimes complain that they find it boring or tedious. Well, I think that unfortunately, this might th there may be some truth in that. But quite frankly, I find walking for extended periods of time quite boring too. But I try to do it because I know it's good for my health. So maybe this is what we have to think about is, is it good for our hearing health to do this sort of listening training? I try to emphasize to people that even doing things like listening to talking books, um, if you can't understand what's being said by the, the word alone, if you can find an unabridged book and then read along with it at first. I also have a lot of materials that I've recorded on PowerPoint where people can click on the speaker on the PowerPoint and, and hear my voice. Um, I call them home hearing. Again, contact me if you're interested in that. They're available for a, um, a minimal charge. All I all I ever ask people to do is just cover the cost of postage and mm -hmm. um, and putting them on a memory stick. But um, right. those sorts of materials people can use at home. Mm -hmm. um, Hear My Quips, Harry Levitt's program is also really good. And it's fun. If you've, um, if you've got a literary bent, I think you'll enjoy Read My Quips. OK. Um, Mary Clark also mentions um, Tiger speech. Are you familiar with that? I'm familiar with it, but I've never used it. Um, but I know a lot of people who do, and I know a lot of people think it's a wonderful program. Um, uh, Asha, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, she commented on wanting the PowerPoint just to reiterate that we will post the recording of the webinar on the replay page as well as uh, the PowerPoint. Um, so that's great because anybody who missed tonight can also watch it or you can watch again if you um, are so inclined to do that too. So um, I think by all accounts um, this was a really excellent presentation. Um, I see one more question from um, Jen. How does training differ from what can be learned from having normal conversations with people? 
Normal conversations are obviously extremely important, but something I've often wondered about is if I get someone in here for two hours and my face is covered for half of it, they are receiving literally thousands of words auditory only in constrained conditions in some parts, but open set in others. So they're getting the experience that I don't think is possible to replicate in just conversational practice. Um, conversational practice is very important, but I do think you need to focus on other uh, training as well. Um, somebody has asked if auditory training is covered by any type of insurance. I think it is. I certainly um, can't claim any such um, things because um, I don't have um, qualifications that are recognized in the United States. Um, what I do is I work as a volunteer at the Hearing Rehabilitation Foundation. This is my retirement hobby. And um, I ask people to make a small donation to the foundation uh, to help cover the costs. I don't know if you just heard the train go by. A train goes past here about once every day. Why of all days, to the, at all times of the day, did it choose right now? <laughs> um, you know, we, um, I'm able to do this because um, I don't. I can act as a volunteer. Um, it is very difficult. I know that there, there is some scope for speech pathologists to provide such training, and I hope that many of them will. Some do do it already, and I, I would hope that there will be many more do it over the next few years. Uh, is there um, at some point a plateau that a person with uh, cochlear implants might reach? Oh, yeah. I'm sure there is. Um, I just don't think it comes after three months or six months, which is what people commonly talk about. I've seen people continue to improve over a period of years. And it's really interesting to watch and to realize just how much more adept the person is. I think it's unreasonable, quite honestly, to think that a person will maximize their performance in a short period of time. Um, and certainly, I think that with training, you accelerate the rate at which you get to the optimal level. One of the things that I often say, and I know a lot of people don't like me saying it, is that I don't think there are all that many cochlear implant users, adults, who truly attain their optimal level of performance. And one of the things I would love to see is provision made for training so that people can really be as good as they can possibly be. <laughs> okay, somebody said that they, they did hear the train go by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Um, one, um, I think we probably have uh, time for one last question. Um, uh, do you have any research regarding pediatric auditory training? I am currently doing research that is looking into the evolution of auditory training to auditory immersion and the impact that cochlear implants has had on the change of auditory training. I do have some information. I think probably the best thing to do is please contact me at the uh, email address that's given on this page, h-e-a-r-f at aol.com, and I'll get back to you. That's obviously far too big an area to cover in a, in a short comment. Um, okay. I think that there's, uh, there's some good um, uh, conversation going on about different uh, um, programs, Tiger, Brain Fitness, <laughs> so that's great that there are some, at least some online resources in the absence of um, somebody who can provide training in, in person. Um, so that's really great. I, uh, as I mentioned, the recording of tonight's webinar will be posted. I'll try to get that uh, posted as quickly as possible. I know there are several people that were not able to make it tonight that are clamoring and waiting for me to get it posted. So I'll do that as soon as I possibly can. Um, I am on vacation for the next week, um, but 
um, I will try to get that posted along with the slides. Um, thank you very much again, Jeff. This was really very, very interesting and hope you'll consider presenting again. And um, thank you again. Okay, and thank and you again uh, very much, Karen, for providing uh, CART this evening. Um, and we'll see everybody next month for another webinar on the 17th of August talking about um, children with hearing loss. So uh, again, thank you very much, Jeff, and good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks very much, Nancy.